All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Hamish Knox, who is up in lovely Canada. How are you doing, Hamish? I'm pretty fantastic today, John. It is uh, a little bit sunny, but uh, definitely not as sunny as my experience with San Diego. Yeah, and you're in the what's it, the Calgary area, is it? I'm in the Calgary area, uh, hour east of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Hamish supports entrepreneurs to sustainably scale their sales so they can eventually exit for the number for their number instead of the number they're told to take. One of the top franchises in the Global Sandler Network, the only Canadian recipient of the David H. Sandler Award, Sandler's highest uh, highest honor. Uh, and you're also the creator and host of the Fun Full Funnel Freedom podcast, easy for me to say, uh, which celebrates uh, lead sales leaders and the success they've created. And you, you were just mentioning the book, uh, Accountability, uh, you know, the Sandler, the Sandler way, mm -hmm. 2014, it's coming up on its anniversary. It is, yeah. The Accountability of the Sandler Way uh, was my first book, came out November 1st of 2014. And then uh, my second book is Change the Sandler Way, which came out in November of 2016. Yeah, there you go. Excellent. It's an anniversary of that one. We're going to be coming around pretty fast, too. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today is that age-old issue of sales leadership. And let me let me ask you, Hamish, why does, why does sales leadership, why is it still like a perennial problem that doesn't seem to ever get solved? And like the, the top, the best sales leaders you can think of, you can almost kind of count them on like one hand. Pretty much. Uh, well, it's it's kind of like the conversation that goes on. I have two daughters, nine and 12, and it's the conversation that, go, that goes on about, you know, why are people in general not very good with finance? And it's because, well, we don't teach finance in, in elementary and secondary and, and, and college, uh, you know, personal finance, not the corporate finance that some people might think of when I said, uh, when I said uni. Uh, and it's the same thing in sales leadership. So as entrepreneurs, we often start a business because we're good at whatever the business is that we're delivering on and we don't get trained in in how to lead people in general much less sellers which mm -hmm. are which are a different beast and then the other side of it is the cliche of hey john you're the number one seller you just got promoted congratulations go make a bunch of little use and you're like well how do i do that and management's like well you'll figure it out yeah. well no, usually that's a uh, that ends up in heartache and tears for not only you but also the business who eventually loses their top seller, you, and the sales manager, also you, and now they've got to replace two roles. Yeah, and and it's in, and it is interesting, isn't it? It's one, it's the one role where we literally dump people into, as you said, with no training. You know, not even fundamental management, tra even basic management yeah. training. We don't bother with that. So you know, leadership. We certainly don't teach them you know, how to be coaches. And mm -hmm. as you said, you just say, go create, uh, just do, you are great. Just have them all do what you do. And yeah. oftentimes, you know, that person is like, I don't really know what I do. I don't know whether <laughs> I can really, you know, this unconsciously competent, you can do something that you're really, yeah. really good at, but you, it's impossible to teach someone else how to do it your way. Totally. And so that the reference to that is, uh, I call it success by default or success by design. And pretty much everybody, at least initially, is successful by default. Now, it doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't matter. They, don't, they're, they run bad companies. They're not valuable. However, what it means is, to your point, if someone said, hey, John, how did you get from there to here? You're like, I did stuff and things and it worked. <laughs> and, and that also from that exit standpoint, Companies don't buy, I did stuff and things. They buy systems and processes that say, hey, you went from here to here. Here's how we did it. And in fact, I had a client who did a half billion dollar exit. And one of the, the things that was shared with me by one of their leaders uh, from the, their acquirer was, the reason why we're giving you this number is because we can literally go back to the beginning, see how you got here, and we can literally model forward and see that we're going to get our return within our time frame based on the processes that you set up, which is success by design. 
Yeah. And and that's and that's part of the issue, isn't it? I mean, that we still live in this kind of or and sales still to some degree exists in this idea that process belongs to other places. It doesn't belong, you know, and the idea of like process driven sales and, you know, yeah. and all that people kind of push back a little bit against. But as you say, if something isn't if you can't process size and you can't you can't make it repeatable, mm -hmm. well, then you can't coach to it and you can't manage to it. 100%. And, and oftentimes people, and I know that I had this when I was a, in a sales role, is people hear process and they immediately hear handcuffs. Yep. Right? You're going to turn me into an automaton. And actually, and this is also ties into uh, my, uh, my book on accountability, it's actually freedom. Because what you're saying as a leader is, John, here's your guardrails, right? The mountaintop I want you to hit is this, you know, qualify the buyer, right? And then there's subsequent mountaintops we have to hit. But initially, qualify the buyer. Okay, great. John, how you get to that mountaintop? is your own way because you are a unique human being unique communication style the way that you get to that mountaintop is going to be yours however i'm going to coach you to get to the mountaintop within these guardrails and then that is freedom because now you're not like i have to use these cheesy lines or these scripts that make me feel gross i need to hit the mountaintop yeah. and my boss will get me there or support me there to do it in my way so i sound like a human being instead of a robot and it's interesting what you mentioned there, some key things, right, is that you said, I will coach you and I will support you to get there. Because that's the other thing that we often see is that when, when especially when somebody's promoted into the, the sales leadership role, is they immediately decide the best thing they can do is be a super closer, right? And they just parachute in, in at the end of deals and, uh, and totally demotivate the salespeople because they kind of shove them aside and say, oh, I'll get this over the line for you mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And, and the hardest thing for them is to do exactly what you said, is to go back to the beginning of the funnel and be a supportive coach. Absolutely. And, and my buddy Pete Oliver calls that being super rep. And, and what that also does is, from the buyer perspective, they're like, well, why the hell is Hamish here? Why don't I just talk to John? Yeah. Like, like, like I just cut the middleman out and I'll just go directly to, to the to the boss, John, which doesn't help you out at all. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it demotivates me. And then something else that uh, I, I hope is becoming less common, it's still, I still hear about it uh, every now and then, is the boss comes in to be the, the closer and then I'm still expecting the commission. Because it's still my client, yeah. my sale, and then I get my commission report. I'm like, "Hey, where's where's the commission for for the for the sale to John?" Well, I closed that for you, so uh, yeah, that was my deal, and so you don't get anything for that. And it's like, awesome, Indeed.com sales <laughs> jobs. You know, I'm out of here. Uh, and, and so when when we're coaching leaders, uh, sales leaders especially. If you absolutely have to come in, because maybe it's a deal that your seller has never experienced, it's too technical, or it's it's um, you know it's it's just something beyond their ability, um, and they genuinely want you to come in to support getting it across the finish line. Fine, they get the commission, mm -hmm. no matter what, because if if we steal bread off of our sellers' tables, they're going to be going somewhere else. Absolutely. And then and, and the, the other part uh, that we were talking about there, obviously, is the coaching part. And that is something, whatever about management or leadership training or whatever, people are never trained. I mean, or I would say never. There's probably some place somewhere it's happened, but people are never really never trained in how to be coaches. Mm -hmm. And most people's experience of coaching is probably their high school football coach or there's something mm -hmm. like that. Who, and basically, that's like, do this do that and then yeah. everything will be fine right. and, and that's not coaching and certainly not in a, in a professional context in work and business definitely not and 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 there's usually two ways that people uh both manage and coach which is either what did my previous leaders do to me because i liked it or kind of like children what's the opposite of what right it's it's like the kids get out it's like i'll never be my parent and it's like yeah. i'll never be that manager right well that's not good good as well and so yeah you, you just identified that telling not coaching because uh one of david sandler's rules was they can't argue with their own data so when it comes out of their mouth it's real when it comes out of our mouth we're pushy aggressive micromanagers and also if i go john do this and it doesn't work who do you blame yeah you or me yeah right no, the you. other part of that is coaching is and I, I agree with you in all of the training uh that i did i've been in sales since i was 19. um my leaders never got 
how to coach this, right? It was like, we're doing training and you're trained and you're fixed. And it's like, no, that's not the way humans work. Mm-hmm. Um, also, coaching is usually treated as, as an event, right? Mm-hmm. So I coach John. Like, okay, great, but humans aren't light switches. So coaching needs to be an event. So John, we're going to talk about this. What specific actions are you going to commit to to start adjusting? Okay, great. When are we going to get together within the next ideally two weeks or less to check in and see how things went? And then we can iterate from there because there is no one path to the mountaintop. There is no the way. There is a way. And so we, in the coaching session, we figure out a way and then you go out and field test it. And then we come back and go, okay, that didn't work entirely. It got you halfway. Now let's adjust and try to get and, and get you further up the mountaintop. Yeah. Hey, and another thing I wanted to ask you, Hamish, because I, I see this sometimes too, is that, you know, because we're hardwired as humans for some reason uh, to want to fix things all the time, right? And so yeah. we look at, we take our salesperson and instead of going, oh, they've got some seriously good strengths here that I really need to accentuate, mm-hmm. that I really need to figure out how I can leverage. Instead, mm-hmm. I go, oh, they're not very good at this. They're not very good at that. So I'm just going to focus all my energy on trying to fix these things that yeah. potentially I'm never going to be able to fix. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and, and that's uh, uh, another one of Sandler's rules was sales is not a place to get your emotional needs met. And I modify that to leadership is not a place to get your emotional needs met. And so when we have, and and, and it's usually men as well who have this, like, I'm going to fix them. And it's <laughs> like, no, they're not a machine. They're not an mm-hmm. engine that you're going to tinker on. They're a human being with their own hopes and fears and dreams and worldview. And so it's meeting them where they're at not where we think they should be, right? Well, John, based on your years of experience and your success, you know, you should be here. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that's awesome, but that's mm-hmm. also my opinion. That's not reality. So we need to take our ego out of the equation and be humble and say, okay, John, you're here. Here's what I'm observing, right? So we're taking this away from John, the human being. We're talking about specific, observable, measurable. I can take a drone, follow you around and say, John, this is the data that this drone has given me. I want to analyze this as a performance thing, not a personal attack. Mm -hmm. And then we can have a real conversation about where are you at to where you want to be. And then I, as your leader, can support you in bridging that gap. Because if ever a team member feels like they're being personally attacked, the the whole conversation's over. There's no motivation. There's no development. And again, they're probably looking for for a new job. Yeah, no, no, I'm absolutely a hundred percent, and and I think that's uh, and and the other part I think that's real interesting now, Hamish as well is that we have so many different generations in the workforce now. Mm-hmm. Somebody said five, somebody else said six. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I believe anything at this stage. It seems that we have so many generations yeah. at this stage, but um, but so another challenge for for sales leaders is that mm-hmm. you have to kind of like deliver messages differently to different yeah. groups, to different people. And totally. you know, your, your one size fits all doesn't work. No, not at all. And, and as humans, we tend to communicate in the way that we want to be communicated with, right? Mm-hmm. Like I am a 30,000 foot and bottom line communicator, right? Tell me the chapter heading, tell me the result. Everything else in the middle is what I have teams or consultants or, or contractors for, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not to diminish the importance yeah. of everything between here and here. It just means that this stuff fries my brain. And if you want me to be at my peak, please don't put me in this, in this, help me get the right people to, to do those things. And ultimately it, we need to communicate in the way that our people want to be communicated with. And this is a big part of my, uh, my second book on change, where we talk about like communicating change and how do we do it effectively? And I was at a round table of leaders. Uh, this is several months ago and someone of course brought up them damn kids. And, and I was looking around, I was like, well, we used to complain about millennials and now it's Gen Z. Like it just, it continues, the cycle continues, right? And now, now the millennials are complaining about Gen Z. And so someone was like, oh, you know, these Gen Z, da, da, da. And I put my hand up and I said, who trained them? Because they didn't just show up at our workplace going like, I have a way to make my boss mad at me today. Yeah. I saw it on TikTok. It's going to be amazing. No, they were trained that way. So we have to take time to understand our team members as humans, not Mm -hmm. robots. And when we can do that, then we can start to understand, okay, 
John likes to have messages communicated this way. Hamish likes them this way. So even if John and Hamish are in the same room, I will address Hamish first because John likes the details. So he's going to hang out while I do the chapter headings with Hamish. And then I can have an effective communication with both of them at the same time. Yeah, no, and and that's a, that's a great example there, though, because if you think of you flipped it and did the other way around, right? And you did the, you did the really deep dive detail first, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm the high level guy, I'm just checked out now. So you're so the actual the way you're sequencing it is is uh, is intentional, and I think that's the biggest thing is is the is the challenge now is is to make sure that your interactions are intentional and you've actually planned out what you're going to do and why. Very, very true. Yeah. If we're, if we are flying by the seat of our pants, especially as a leader, uh, we are going to go offside very, very, very quickly. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that we have to script by don't script anything. Audiences, you're listening, please don't script things out. That comes off horribly, no matter who you're talking to. But we need to have those, again, the mountaintops, right? What's the mountaintop I need to hit in this interaction with John or in this interaction with my team or whatever it might be? Having that pre-call plan done, I had a, I was coaching a leader years ago. They were an absolute amazing operational leader. CEO tapped them on the shoulder and said, want to take over our Canadian sales team? And they went, I guess so, boss. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you get me some help? And so they reached out to me and we started working together. And uh, they, they went within six months from managing three people on the Canadian team to 15 people on the North American team. Um, and one of the things that they that we shared with them early on is you got to pre call plan your coaching calls like you tell your sellers to pre call plan you as a leader need to pre call plan your coaching calls, especially if you feel it's going to be an awkward conversation, because if you don't do that, the minute that one of you gets triggered, you're completely off the plot. And so we want to make sure that we have this. And I even coached uh, this leader to say. To their seller, I've got a, I've, I've pre-call planned this. I want to make sure we're prepared. Here's the the points we need to hit in this conversation. Are you okay if we make sure that we hit these, and then we can talk about all the other things that might come up over the course of our conversation? And the next time I saw them, they're like, "That was the best coaching call I ever had in my right. life." Right. Yeah, because you didn't blindside them, and and you, and and that's a really important point that you just raised there about call planning the the coaching call. The, the other part that you often see is like, you know, people will start off going, oh, great, I'm in this position now and I'm going to be an excellent coach. So, Hamish, we're going to set up a weekly coaching call, right? Uh, let's get it on the calendar now. Mm -hmm. And we set that up and then we do the first few. And then mm -hmm. week three, I say, oh, Hamish, something, sorry, something's come up. I'm sorry, I'll have to cancel this week. And then, and then next yeah. week, can we move this? I'm sorry, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Do you mind? And over time, what I'm communicating to you is that this doesn't matter. I don't even I don't even want to do it. A hundred percent. So back at the uh, the 2024 Sandler Summit in Orlando in March, my topic was I spoke and my topic was how to intentionally design a sales culture, and and I I shared with the audience that our corporate culture is the behavior that's approved implicitly or explicitly, and humans are animals, which is a biological fact, humans are animals, and animals have no capacity to process language. So as a leader, if we do the thing, and I actually told a story about my ex who, who got a new manager, and they're, they're in a technical role, they're not in, they're not in sales, and they had a new manager come in from outside the company and talked a great game about accountability, reliability, et cetera, et cetera. And then within like three weeks, they started doing all the things that you started mentioning. And, and by the way, they wouldn't even do the sorry, something came up. It would just be like declined. Right. And, and the, you know, the meeting's been canceled. And it's like, what the heck? And so shockingly, my ex's colleagues on the team started to become less reliable, started to become less accountable, which really frustrated her. And I'm trying to support her mm -hmm. as her partner because she's pulling her hair out going, why can I not get my team members to give me the things I need to successfully support our clients in, in other departments? Well, it's because the leader taught them everything they needed to know about accountability and reliability by their behavior instead of by what they said. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the, that's the, one of the most important takeaways. I mean, people know this kind of intellectually, but they somehow manage to uh, manage to um, not adhere to it. A lot of the times is that, you know, you model behavior. That's what people do. People look yeah. at you and the behavior that you model 
and uh, if you model behavior, a certain behaviors consistent consistently, then mm -hmm. that's who you are, and that can be good or that can be bad. So, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, they're not really going to listen to what you say; they're going to listen to how you behave. Absolutely, there was a, a commercial uh, up here in Canada for several years, and it was about it was basically like, what are you teaching your children? And so it's this mother, and she's watching her daughter play house with one of her friends, and and they're they're literally playing like someone's coming over for a visit. And so her daughter opens the door to her playhouse, and she says, "Oh, welcome in. Would you like something to drink? We have beer, wine, champagne, whiskey." And the mother's face just completely falls, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, what have I taught my daughter about how to entertain?" uh guests when when they come over to your house and it's the same thing in business yeah yeah, yeah. it wouldn't be unusual in an irish playhouse <laughs> <laughs> well listen hamish this has been fantastic all of hamish's information will be below this uh video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do yeah, thanks. Thank you, John. So uh, I'm part of the team at Sandler uh, up in Calgary. We have clients literally around the world. And uh, as John mentioned earlier, we support them in uh, having more effective human to human uh, interactions so they can sustainably scale their sales and then eventually exit for their number instead of the number they're told to take. There are not many Hamish Knoxes uh, in North America, so I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn. You can also go to go.sandler.com slash Hamish to uh, get some more details and to get in touch uh, with me or a member of my team. Yeah, you probably find a few more in the Scottish Highlands, but not around uh, not around North America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again, Hamish. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you.